Hello and welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. We both enjoyed the book immensely, and we're going to get into some of your a bit counterintuitive advice. And I'm, I'm pretty excited to share it with our audience because I think uh, a lot of the show, our audience nods their head and, and agrees. And then sometimes we, we hit them with some interesting topics. And today's discussion will definitely be interesting. But tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got to where you are today. I started out as a lawyer. I grew up in New York and um, was in law school my second year at Vanderbilt Law School and was told by the managing partner of the firm that he didn't think I really had what it took to be a successful attorney and that I should not count on getting hired by that firm at the end of the year or for the next year and also consider dropping out of law school. And so I migrated out of the law because I ended up agreeing with him and ended up becoming a talent agent, which is where I've spent most of my life for the last 25, 30 years, up until about four years ago when I decided to become an aspiring author and a communications and career coach. And so that's been, um, that's been my life. And when it comes to coaching, career, and communications, uh, it feels like in, in today's environment, it's rapidly evolving and changing. And I'm certain that many in our audience are feeling some pressure in those two areas of what's going on in my career and how can I communicate more effectively. And one thing you've talked about in the book extensively is actually seeking critical feedback. And... I enjoy it. I know Johnny enjoys it. At times it can be a little difficult, but it really provides an opportunity for growth. And I think many of us, unfortunately, shy away from critical feedback and aren't able to actually handle that feedback. So dig in why you think critical feedback is so important and, and how we can get better at actually receiving it. Well, I think it's just, honestly, it just comes down to a mindset shift. That's all it is. I think that we all grow up with a lot of critical feedback in many areas of our life. If we've ever played sports, if we played a musical instrument, if we went to school, we got critical feedback on classwork, you know, metrics of writing, English, math, science. So we are used to it in many realms of our life. The thing is, is that I think that somewhere along the way, there's been kind of a cultural change, which I do talk about a little bit with great inflation and participation trophy culture morphing into MVP trophy and then HR departments. So at the end of the day, I think you should be much more afraid of not getting feedback than getting feedback. Because think about most people who don't get feedback, unless you're amazing, which few of us are, you're really just solidifying your own mistakes and you're not improving the things you could be easily rectifying. And so if you think about the danger is, are you going to be in the exact, exact same spot professionally in a year, two, three years? And then invariably, someone's going to go by you and you're going to be expendable. So that's what should be the thing that most is creating fear in your life is not getting feedback. Now, here in this show, we have talked to a number of people who have complained about the self-esteem movement. And one notably is Stephen Hayes, the godfather of acceptance commitment therapy. And I think... A lot of people are well aware of the self-esteem movement and noticed its flaws and how it has affected our youth. And of course, as they go into school, there's great inflation. But the one that stuck out to me was how this self-esteem movement and these ideas have bled into adult life. And one of the, the pieces that I never thought about but you had brought it up in this book was companies don't fire anyone anymore. And, and so that feedback of not being good enough or that you've come up short has now been masked with, you're going to now need to go to these skills training programs. And one of the things that I loved was if you find yourself in this skills training program, know that you're not, that you're not being, in this program to get the help that you need. This is an insurance policy for the company that you're working for to not get in trouble. And so could you speak a little bit about that? Because I think people need to be aware of how this plays a role in their life and what they're not getting from a flat out, you've failed in your job, we are letting you go. It's interesting the way you frame this. I agree with you completely and Funny enough, my book really doesn't get that into the macro of this. I say it's a problem, but I'm not here to solve that problem. I can't solve that problem. That's a societal, cultural issue. 
And I can't change all corporate America or the way we're all dealing with each other. What I am saying is that on the micro level, hopefully if you're reading this book or if you are um, you know, someone who is not happy with your lot in life, so to speak, that you're gonna make the change. And all this has to change from within, right? You're gonna be the one that has to demand that change yourself. And if you don't, then nothing's gonna change. And that is the essential framing that I think people should be taking this from. We've gotten so used to just be guided through life without having to come to terms with any harsh realizations. And I agree with you. It would be a bigger battle to change society as a whole. But if you find yourself in this position, you need to look at what you're being told critically and honestly, which now plays a role in you taking more responsibility for understanding where you're at and what is happening so that you can see this as an opportunity for growth. Exactly. Because look, I mean, the problem is so many of us, we, 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 we mistake no news for good news. Oh, I, I, my boss has never told me I was doing anything wrong. I must have been great. Or, you know, I got a good review. I, you know, not realizing maybe they didn't want to tell you why you weren't that great. I mean, one fascinating thing is I talked to the head of an a, head of HR for a major company with almost 400,000 employees. And he said, well, we stealth, we stealthily coach people out. We don't even, we don't even let them know they're on the hot seat. They never know what hit them. And so like, to me, that's just cruel, but I understand why companies do it because they don't want to get sued and all these other reasons. But at the other end of it is an unsuspecting person who probably tried hard and just will never know what they could have done better. And that's the scary part in, in my mind. And for me in graduate school, getting that pointed, critical, negative feedback was a turning point and an opportunity for me to realize that, hey, the way I'm perceiving the world and the way people are perceiving me is not matching reality. And you need that cold, hard truth to grow, to change, to improve. And if we're being coddled in sports and in college and now even in our career, we're not setting ourselves up for success in meaningful ways in the things that matter in life. And to Johnny's point, being sent to a, a skills training program, for many people, they view it as, hey, this is a break from work. I'm getting to learn something. They don't understand what HR is actually telling them and certainly don't understand that if we don't improve in this area, we're on the chopping block. You guys are, are so right. It's crazy. I, I, I talk about, I didn't use the right name in the book because I wanted to protect the innocent, but I, I was hired two or three years ago by a major bank to coach someone who is on the executive vice president level. I mean, really high up, reporting directly to the CEO. And he was struggling with some issues around how he communicated the CFO and how he communicated to the CEO and the board. And they hired me and he had no idea this was like DEFCON 5. He was on the chopping block by the time I got there. And he was like, oh, you little annoying coach. Like, uh, don't, don't bother me with your little communication tips. Like, thank you very much. And I, I actually told the bank, you guys should fire me because I'm not going to help this guy. He's not really committed. And in the end, I, I can't fully blame the bank, but I would give them some culpability that they didn't tell him, hey, buddy, like we're hiring this guy because we think this is a major problem. This isn't just some nice thing to have for you because we want to like get you to the next level. We want you to survive here. And because that was never communicated, he didn't put the time and the effort in and he was gone in a year. One of the things that's upsetting for AJ and I is we've been running live emotional intelligence training programs for the last close to 15 years. And we're seeing more and more young men come in because well, they've been passed over for a promotion or they found themselves already in two of these trainings and out the door. And they're starting to realize, hey, wait, I think it's something with me. And the most upsetting thing is they come in so damaged when in actuality, it's just a couple small points that if somebody had been constructive, they would have been able to not, over, not only overcome that, but then flourish, flourish. That you, you guys just stole the entire, you guys just stole the entire premise of my book in one in one little paragraph. So yeah, I, I mean that's it. 
<laughs> well, that is why I enjoyed reading it because a lot of what you've talked about in this book is a lot of the work that, that we do at the Art of Charm for over the last 15 years. And you have offered so much practical advice in the book. So yes, everyone should pick it up. There's uh, plenty of great insights and plenty of, of activities and um, exercises to get you moving. So in this coddling culture, how can we get the feedback that we need? If, if you're sitting on the other end of this and you're realizing, I'm feeling stuck, I'm feeling passed over, I'm not reaching my potential, I'm sick and tired of seeing people that I think less than in the skills department, in the drive department, get ahead, but I'm not getting the feedback that I need to grow, how do you propose we actually go about getting that feedback in a meaningful way? Well, I think, first of all, make yourself vulnerable to the feedback. You know, you got to put yourself in a position where the other person doesn't feel like, well, if I say to AJ, Hey, you know what? You need to work on your voice. He's not going to run to HR and, 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 and get me in trouble or never want to talk to me again. So you really have to make yourself available to it in the right emotional state. And if you change your mindset and say, this is what I really want to grow, then I think the other person will welcome it. And then you got to find the right people. You know, you don't just want to find someone who is not invested in your future. You know, I talk about tough love and part of tough love is love. And that love has to be the person or the people in your life that are really invested in your growth. And also find someone that you respect that knows the field that you have the weaknesses in. Now, look, my book doesn't cover everything, obviously. It's just one tool in the toolbox. And that's the communication tool of what I call private speaking, which is you know, the, the aggregation of all our interactions with people. And I do think that often that's the tool that's missing. That's the tool in the EQ. I know you guys teach EQ in the, in that emotional intelligence toolbox. That's the one tool that we often don't have the, you know, kind of the metrics around it, the language around it, and really to understand what we need to improve. So I think if you do that, and then, you know, to build on that, Find a way to get yourself what I would call the diagnostic x-ray, right? If you had anything wrong with you in your life, medically speaking, you'd go to a doctor and get a diagnosis. There's nothing you could do to improve your bad, your ill health unless you had the proper diagnosis. But often, once you have the diagnosis, there is a treatment plan, right? The problem here is that people don't even get the diagnosis. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. Well, I know myself that... Outside of working with clients, I, I have encountered opportunities to give feedback, but I've even been reticent to give that feedback because I'm not sure the other person is prepared to handle it or they truly want it. And I, I feel that there is a nuance to asking for that feedback. I think a lot of people will flippantly say, yeah, give me the feedback, but really they're looking for the positive. They're, they're not looking for the constructive. They're looking for the attaboy, the pat on the back, the participation, the effort. And unfortunately... When you're in a leadership role and it's not clear the nuance, you, you are a little hesitant. You do hold back because you don't want to knock someone off their feet with something they weren't expecting. So you have kids teaching them to go out and, and seek critical feedback. What are some strategies for us to, to blast through that when maybe our superiors are just as hesitant to give that feedback because of HR, because of past experiences where they got called out? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I think there's a couple things you can do in your life to change that. And I, I, you know, I don't have the best company in the world, but I do have one good thing going is that I have created this culture where it's a very much of an ongoing feedback 360 kind of mentality. So I think one is if you, you know, you're the boss, if you start asking your colleagues and people that report to you for feedback, that's a very good first step because it shows that you're open to it also. And you should be like, nobody's perfect. Right. And we should all wanting, we should all be wanting to improve in things, even things we're teaching that we can improve upon. So that's one thing. The second thing that you can do is I think limit it, be very limiting in what the feedback you want is. And that's where I think my book hopefully gives you the opportunity to create a very productive and constructive conversation. All we're talking about is your communication. I'm not telling you I don't like you as a person. I'm not telling you I don't like your wife or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, whatever. I'm not telling you anything of that. I, I, if I just ask you, hey, listen, AJ, what do you think about my authority? Do I come across as, a, as someone who seems competent? And if not, why not? Is my voice good? Is my body language good? Do I make eye contact when I speak to you? 
Now you're getting down into a very molecular level, so to speak. And when you get into that molecular level, it's less personal, right? If I was to say to you, look, AJ, I don't like your empathy. You just don't seem like a very empathetic guy. That's hurtful, right? That's a very global thing to say to someone. But if I said, AJ, I think you need to be warmer. And the way that I think you could be warmer is if you smiled more when I spoke, or if you made eye contact with me and you acknowledged me more when I'm talking, that's less personal, right? And you know, it's funny, like my, my daughter and I have been playing tennis now in this pandemic and she's 13 and I'm, as of two days ago, 54. And she's telling me what I could be doing, but daddy, you're holding your racket open like this. What are you doing? And she knows that I want the feedback. I mean, not as much as she's been giving me, but we have a very constructive conversation about it. Well, happy birthday. Happy belated birthday. I think for a lot of us, getting drilling down to that molecular level that you're talking about is where the meaningful change can happen. If we get global feedback, oh, you're not warm enough, you don't have enough energy, well, what, what does that mean? And how do I actually parse that into to change in my own behavior and the way people are perceiving me? And I, I think most of us gloss over those generalizations because they are not prescriptive enough for us to act on. You know, you, I, I love that you said that because you just stole one of my big sentences. I always say, what does that mean? So I use it in the context of, I, I, I'll say to somebody, if, if you were graduating from college and you did have on your report card, you know, your major, in, let's say you majored in, in, in biology and you had a 3.8 and you had uh, an A in biology, uh, an A minus in chemistry and blah, blah, blah. And then there was something that said EQ, right? And you got a B minus in EQ. Your re response would be, what the hell does that mean? What am I supposed to do with that? Like, that's so not actionable. And that's why I tried to get, you know, funny, you know, molecular in this, because then there's something you can do. Because to your exact point, if you hear this amorphous, global, just gobbledygook word, and I've actually gotten some critical feedback on my book. People have ripped me on social media going, what the hell is this guy talking about? What does authority mean? It's what a dumb line or what is warmth? These things are so stupid. They don't mean anything. And I want to write back. I agree. Read the book, please. I agree with you. But I can't do that, of course. Well, I appreciate that you you read the critical feedback and you do seek it out in all of these areas. And, you know, Johnny, this is an anecdote from when we started the company. I, I joined the team a little late. I was in graduate school and we were running one of our first programs and we were getting some feedback from the customers after the program. And I remember sitting in the room and we had some business partners in the past who were allergic to critical feedback, didn't want to hear it, wanted to put their fingers in their ears. And I was like, no, th this is where we improve. We need this information. And that forged a bond with me and Johnny, realizing that if you're truly growth minded, the positives are great. Everyone loves to be built up. But the negatives are also a really important way of weighing that out to build not only the emotional intelligence, but the self-awareness needed to be a competent leader and communicator. Now, in the book, you talk about a few studies, and there's one seminal study from the Carnegie Foundation around awe. And you started to talk about some of these concepts, and you got some critical feedback on these concepts. But let's dig in there what you mean by awe and, and how we can actually make this more prescriptive in our feedback. I will say this in defense of my critics, awe in and of itself is a meaningless term. And it is a, a very um, broad topic. And I'm not reinventing the wheel here by talking about authority, warmth, and energy. These are words that have been around in language for hundreds of years. And in and of itself, it's worthless. But what I am suggesting is that if you put real um, meaning behind authority, real meaning behind warmth, and you dig into it and you figure out a way to deconstruct it, just like you can deconstruct anything. If somebody could figure out how to deconstruct that shirt that you're wearing and maybe make it with a little bit of a finer cotton for a little bit cheaper, they might put that company out of business. Somebody could deconstruct anything, right? And that's what I think, that's where I think life is interesting is in the deconstructing and the rebuilding, right? And so what awe is, is a way to, I mean, in a very, con it's funny, I'm gonna use this term. It's to deconstruct yourself in a constructive way and to figure out a way to tear down those walls a little bit, analyze them and come back stronger in all those categories. So that's the broad answer. And I can get into each of them if you'd like. We will. And, and the, the remarkable thing about the study that, and this is done in 1918, right? And this, is, this has stood the test of time. It's been replicated many times. And, and many of us get this wrong. 
15% of your success is determined by your proficiency. That's a bucket of cold water for a lot of our listeners who pride themselves in their proficiency. 85% is the ability to actually connect where the communication happens. And I would say in this environment, it's even more important when we are all working remote, we are all on Zoom, we're more disconnected than ever. Being able to connect is how you're going to ascend in your career and become that authority. So let's dig into authority first because there are some components. I think you made a really, really good point. I do think it needs a tiny bit of clarification because I think some people, not you, but some other people are going to misinterpret that data. So what I have heard from other people is, oh, well, the 15% is not that important because it's 15%. But that's not true. That is not true. If you want to be a dentist, a doctor, a lawyer, anything requiring technical skills, a podcast host, you better damn sure be good at the 15%. The 15% is very important. It's essential. The reason why I think the Carnegie Foundation study and the replications of it only has it at a 15% correlation and causal relationship is because that part of life is what's so taught. That's where all the resources are. That's where all of our time and energy goes. And we, we all, not all, but many of us can master that 15% technical part with enough training. And so you end up competing with so many people that are good enough on the bell curve of the technical stuff, that that can't be differentiated. That's the part of your life that gets commoditized. So I just wanted to make that point. And that's a great point because we're certainly not discounting that 15%, but realize that that's not the whole picture. And unfortunately, a lot of us, because the way we're raised, because the way we're trained in starting out our career, we put all of our focus and effort and energy there, and then we wonder why we're not ascending into leadership roles, why we're not taking on more responsibilities, and just flat out why people don't like us. And you could be as proficient and as skillful as possible. And we, we see this with clients who are doctors and lawyers, and they still end up coming to our programs because they go, I'm not connecting with people. I don't have the influence. I don't have the authority. And I've heard that I don't have warmth, but I don't really know what that means. So how, how do I build that? So well, let, let's unpack awe a little bit further, because I think we talked in a recent episode around authority. I know that a lot of our listeners would love, especially starting out in their career, to, to gain that authority. So what do we mean by that? What are the, the discrete skills that we can really focus on? Okay, so think about it in terms of everybody that you're going to be competing against, like we talked about earlier in the 15%, they're all good enough in the substantive qualities of their job, right? Let's just in this pretend hypothetical or enough people are. So the question is, if everybody's competent substantively, it comes down to who is going to be able to communicate that competence and excellence stylistically. And remember, the most competent, excellent person on the substantive side is not perceived as the most competent person on the stylistic side, and that really matters. And so the problem is, is that the end user doesn't even know who's more competent, right? I, I told this before, it's in the book a little bit. I ended up having, uh, woke up one day last June with just the most horrific pain in my leg I've ever felt. I thought I had a blood clot. It turned out that I have bilateral uh, rheumatoid arthritis in, in both hips and I needed double hip replacement. And I went to, living in New York City, one of the benefits of New York City is that we have the finest orthopedic hospital in the world in the hospital for special surgery. And so I went to see a doctor and he said, you need to have your hip replaced. I wanted to get a second opinion. And this guy gave me a second opinion. You need to have your hip replaced. And then my wife, who was dealing with her own medical issues, had this physical therapist that she became so uh, beholden to. She loves this guy. If he told her to get brain surgery, I'm pretty sure she would go and get it. And so he said, look, don't get operated on until you go see Dr. Edwin Sue. You got to just go talk to him. So I went to go see Dr. Sue, and he said, you don't, need, you don't need hip replacement surgery. You're a very healthy, at the time, 52, almost 53-year-old guy. You're in perfectly good shape. You have, the, you have great hips. You really need this thing called a hip resurfacing surgery, and it'll preserve the bone and all this stuff. And the, the previous two doctors were like, you know, the best – uh, medical training. They had gone to the best residency programs, et cetera, et cetera, as did Dr. Seuss. So they all had the 15%. But he communicated with a level of detached authority 
that he was just like, look, I will do anything you want me to do, or I'll do nothing. Go have the surgery from someone else. But I am telling you, and he did it so much better than me. He basically said, I'm telling you, this is the right and best surgery for you. You're going to have the best recovery. You're going to have a great life with this surgery. And in the end, I said, sign me up. And he operated on me, did an incredible job. And I'm waiting only because of the pandemic for the other hip, because he can't do both at the same time. And that incredible, quiet, self-assured authority, the, the lack of salesmanship in his quote unquote salesmanship, he, he had me at hello. It was incredible. Well, he must have done a good job because you're out there playing tennis with your 13 year old <laughs> daughter. So do you want to go through the points of, of his authority uh, to sure. dissect yeah. those out? Yeah, first of all, it's being emotionally committed to your own words, right? I, I'm very committed to my own words in a, in a very emotional, high energy way. He's committed to his own words emotionally in a low energy way. So that's one thing, but you have to have that emotional commitment. The second thing is your body language. You know, you have to communicate in a way that's consistent with your words. I think when you say something and you're very self-assured and you're looking into the person's eyes and saying, look, this is what's best for you. I'm telling you, that's a level of authority. The third thing is I talked about this detachment is that you can't be married to the outcome that you want. This is not your outcome. It's their outcome. And if you have that level of assuredness paired with not needing to have your way or to be right or to have that outcome, that presents his authority. And then there are some of just the little mechanical things like finishing your sentences strongly and completing your words and ending the sentence as strong as you started it, having inflection in your voice. The other thing is not using filler words and having a strong voice, standing up straight, you know, leaning into someone. And those are the things that I think you can do as a high energy person, a low energy person, a tall person, a short person, it doesn't matter. And he did it in, in, in that way. And, and I was, you know, it was very obvious to me how committed he was. For me, as I got more into sales, learning, dissecting and helping support the company, I realized that if I went into these calls, these sessions, outcome driven and so focused on proving to this person that it was the right decision for them, the more attached I was to that decision, the less likely they were to listen to me, follow up, respond. And that ability to be detached from the result to say, you know what, if you don't believe me, go to another surgeon, you know, we're not a good fit. Then that is such a commanding presence that immediately strikes that authoritative chord with everyone universally. But many of us are too attached to the outcome are too attached to what the other person thinks or feels. And I love that you highlight that so that our listeners can realize, am I being too attached to this outcome? Am I communicating that this matters too much to me that's turning the other person off and losing that authority that I'm trying to gain in my career? I think it's true. And, and listen, there's a guy who did not make it into my book that I interviewed that I just want to highlight him because I think he was the one who taught me about detached authority. I didn't really even know the term until I met him. His name is Dr. Alec Miller. And he is a friend of mine from the University of Michigan. And he went on to become a, uh, a very prominent doctor of psychology. He has a PhD and he's an expert in child, a teen anxiety, depression, suicide prevention. And he has a very, very well-regarded clinic in Westchester, New York, where he takes on the highest of the high risk that the parents will take them to Dr. Alec Miller when they really feel like there's no hope that their children could ever get out of this horrible depression. And he talked to me about the onboarding process of this clinic. And he said that he tells people, look, I know that you're depressed. I know that, and again, I'm paraphrasing it in a way that he did it much better. But he says to the extent, I know you have this problem. I know what the light at the end of the tunnel looks like for you. I know it's 17, you can't see the future. But I know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know what 37 can look like for you because I have 50 people who are 37 now who are married with children, living great careers. I know what 33 looks like and on and on and on. This is what the other side of this looks like. This is not a bleak place. It's a bleak temporary place. But you have to be fully committed to this process. And if you're not fully committed, exactly as I want you to be on my terms, you are not going to be allowed into this program. And I don't mind if you say no. It's okay. And he said, in the time he's been doing this, only one person 
refused to be committed to the process and he did not take the person. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to think about not taking someone because you might be doing them to a possible suicide or a life of depression. But he said it didn't matter because he knew he couldn't get the outcome that he needed and wanted for them if they weren't committed to that process. And that's where I think I learned about that power of detached authority. Detachment is certainly powerful. It's going to, it's going, you're going to present your argument in a certain way when you're detached from that. The other thing that I love that you brought up was filler words. I know for myself, the, the longer we have been doing podcasts and the more work that AJ and I do on video, that is one of the things that I've always looked at. And not only is it filler words that are showing up very prevalent in the way people speak nowadays, we also have the issue of uh, the computer communication that we are all so comfortable and we use on a daily basis. And that is now showing up in our regular conversations. And asynchronous communication, when you're standing in front of somebody, doesn't work in the same manner. And it, it comes with its own set of complications. And certainly the only way to be able to see that for yourself, as you mentioned, and one of the things that we do in our classes is to film people and film their communication, film their interactions, which is an incredibly scary thing to do. And I believe you even mentioned in your book that some of your clients found it difficult because the the truth is right there. It's staring you in the face. Yeah. I mean, I understand and I agree with you. It is scary on a certain level, but look, I wrote a blog piece for some an HR magazine recently. And I talked about how not looking in the mirror and not getting feedback is the equivalent of never going to the doctor. And, you know, God forbid, you know, any of us right now had polyps in our colon, you know, if, if you went and ignored that for five years, it, it, it could very likely turn into colon cancer. And if you ignored it for long enough, it would be, it would metastasize and you'd be dead. Nothing you could do about it by the time you had symptoms, right? But if you go for regular colorectal screenings, or if you're a woman and you get breast cancer screenings, you know, we can eliminate 90% of, if, or more of these problems. And I think that's the same thing with your own communication flaws. If you look in the mirror, it might be a little uncomfortable to see the quote unquote polyp that you're communicating with. But if you can eradicate that before it becomes a really bad habit and or it dooms your career and maybe your life to a level of mediocrity, then you, 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 that should be the thing again, that should scare the hell out of you is, is not looking in the mirror. Now you mentioned earlier, a 360 review. And we recommend it with a lot of our clients that we work with. But let's unpack that because I think that is a way for you to go get that quote unquote rectal exam to, to make sure that you're healthy. Right. Um, well, look, I, I, I think that in my own life, maybe it's just because I wrote a book like this. I have, um, you know, people coming up to me all the time, giving me feedback. If people will see this podcast, two or three of my friends will call me and say, Hey, wait a minute. Why, why are you so dark in there? What's with your hands? Why with the body language? Or you're know, talking too fast. Like, and I'll say, well, those guys had me very excited. I'm sorry, but I'll go back and listen and they'll invariably, they'll be right. But the point is, is that if you create this in your life, then it doesn't have to just be a once in a while thing. And look, nobody wants to be under the microscope all the time, but if somebody has the freedom and the latitude to be able to say something to you in the moment, it could not only be really good feedback for you, but could also help you save yourself in a situation that otherwise could be bad for you. And, I, and I'll give you a good example of that. About six months ago, I had a really important meeting in my office and we were sitting around a conference room and I had my phone under my desk, uh, under my, in my pocket. And about an hour into the meeting, a 28 year old guy in my office, I'll give you his name, Kevin Belby. He, he, he texted me and he told me to look at my phone. And I looked at my phone and he sent me a text and, I, and he politely said, shut the F up. You're talking too much. Knock it off. Stop it. And I was so happy. Like here's a guy who's 25 years younger than me who just basically slapped me across the face, you know, in this meeting. I mean, obviously the guy, the other guy in the room couldn't hear it, but the fact that he had the freedom and the latitude and the presence to know that he could say it and that he said it and that it was great advice 
and I ended up taking his advice and stopped and the meeting ended up going a lot better. That to me in a nutshell is what you should be striving for. Yeah. That ability to reach out to peers, to reach out to friends, to reach out to people you worked with in the past and get that 360 feedback on those gaps that you're unaware of. And we're all walking around with these blind spots. We cannot perfectly perceive reality around us. And there are a lot of beliefs and stories going on and emotions that are blurring that reality from right in front of our nose. Now, I want to get into warmth, the W and awe, because I know we have a lot of women listening, and this is a loaded term, and a lot of women have heard feedback on their warmth that is sexist, is detrimental to their career. So one, how do we break down warmth? And two, how do we get actual important feedback on this and not the generic, hey, can you smile more? I don't really like the way you carry yourself at work. Right, so warmth exists whether you like it or not, right? And this, again, I, I, Harper Collins will probably kill me for this, but this book is not for everybody. If, if you're the type of person who doesn't wanna hear feedback that's not suitable to your particular sensitivities, it's not right for you, right? But the, the bottom line is that it doesn't change the fact that you may not ascend in the way that you want in your career because you have a lack of warmth, even if you hate the word, right? So use a different word, but you're still lacking whatever that word is. What it is, is, is that it's the ability to connect with people, right? And it's the ability to make people trust you. And at the end of the day, the most important thing, in my opinion, in any relationship is trust. And trust bleeds into authority and authority bleeds into trust. Going back to my doctor, if he didn't speak with an authoritative tone and also speak in a comforting tone, I wouldn't trust him. He could be have the best hands in the world to use a knife, but it's, it's not going to work. So there are a lot of components that go into it. One is just making the other person feel as if they exist in the relationship. I'm not operating on you because I'm an egomaniac and I want to put another notch on my belt and put more data into my computer. I'm operating on you because I care about your health and your well-being. You know, I want to be on your podcast today not because I want to sell books. I want to be on here because I want you guys to have a good experience interviewing me. And I want your listeners to get something out of this. If they don't, I'm a, I'm, I'm a useless waste to you. And I should be, right? And so if I don't approach the relationship with that level of warmth and acknowledgement of what's in it for you, then why would you trust me? You'll never have me back, right? And ultimately, I think if you don't recognize, again, the uh, molecular aspect of warmth, then you're going to be at your own peril. I think one key component that many of us, and, and we've talked about this, especially with the rise of social media and our phones, is attentiveness. And we don't realize how we carry ourselves in a distracted state that is leading people to not view us as warm. Instead, they're viewing us as couldn't care less, arrogant, aloof. And this is feedback that I got personally in my life. And it, it was jaw dropping to get it at first, because I certainly don't feel that way internally. I care about people. I, I have empathy. I, I am emotionally connected to my peers, but I wasn't showing it because I was distracted. I was in my head. I was thinking about something else when important information was being passed, when emotional bids that needed to be validated were being shared. And when we're walking around without that attentiveness and without a layer of relatability, well, people are going to judge you negatively. There's no getting around that. A hundred percent. Just like you're going to judge other people negatively if they did that to you, even if you didn't even want to, you're going to do it. It's just a subconscious reaction you're going to have to people. And to your point, like having that, aware, having that awareness around that level of, you know, like inattentiveness that you talk about, that alone might help you make a really great change in your life if you can bring that level of self-awareness to the moment. For everyone to understand the effects that it is having on us, I would certainly love to get to a place where everyone realizes, hey, I'm going out, which means I will be leaving my phone at home and I'm going to be in the moment and connect everybody. Because that, I mean, to know that whoever you're talking to is circuitry connected on emotions and being in the same room just because you're in the same room does not mean you're in the same conversation and i think it will go in a, a certainly a long way in helping us solve a, a lot of social issues that we're having right now can i say one quick thing on that it's funny 
I, I, this is like a, maybe a very meta or surreal thing to say, but I've been actually thinking during this podcast, because I have a horrible phone addiction. I'll, I'll admit that to you. Terrible. And, and in the last you know, 45 plus minutes, I haven't looked at my phone once. Because we're on Zoom, maybe even more so than if we were in front of each other, I'm trying to glue myself to you guys looking at you directly. And I'm actually thinking... Plus, this, to me, at least, this is a great conversation about a lot of interesting ideas. But I've been thinking this is a fantastic conversation. I wish all my conversations could be this enriching and rewarding. And frankly, you guys are so present in the moment with me that I'm feeding off that. So in a weird way, like I feel like we're achieving everything that I'd like to achieve in the rest of my life. So thank you. Well, we appreciate that. And we feel the same. And I think as we talked about to start this, many of us aren't on Do Not Disturb. We're looking at our email. We're checking notifications, even when we're on Zoom. And guess what? The other end of that conversation is feeling that. They are perceiving that, and subconsciously, they are docking you in the warmth category. Now, there's one other component that I, I love about warmth and is a big, big point for me and Johnny, and that's humility. And it's so easy to get drunk off of your success and your accomplishments and all the hard work and effort and energy you put in. And many of us especially with the way that social media amplifies the opposite, we aren't as humble and we aren't as uh, full of humility as we need to be to create that warmth. Now, if you're feeling that this is an area to improve, what are your suggestions? Because I know that when I first realized that I was coming across as not humble and not full of humility, man, that was difficult for me to rectify and, and find my way back to. Well, it's a great question. And I, I, I think the answer for me, I can't say it, it would be the right answer for you, is when I married my wife almost 15 years ago, I, I, I was not a particularly religious person. And I would say I'm still not all that religious, but she is. And my children are being raised in observant faith. And the thing that I've gotten out of it more than anything else is this idea that she keeps hammering home to us uh, is that we're not the center of the universe. You know, if, if you believe in a higher being, which I do, Whatever, whoever your God is, it still is, I think the consistent theme among all religions is that we are just mortals and we are not uh, going to live forever. And, and we're not that important in the grand scheme of things. And I think that should give you a level of humility and also a sense of purpose in your life that you are here to serve other people. And if you're not serving other people, then you're not, I think at least, performing the mission that you have in life. And ultimately, marrying her and, and and adopting that aspect of that mindset that we really aren't the center of the universe to me is what I would call insta humility. And it's a big dose of it every day. When you look, when you wake up every morning, I, I don't know if this is true of Christianity or Islam, but in the Jewish faith, you, there's a prayer that you say about like, thank you God for restoring my soul and, 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 and letting me have another day on earth. And if you say that it brings to mind just a tremendous amount of humility in your life every single day. And I think if you can have that, whatever your faith is, you will never, ever lack for humility ever again. And your point about being in service to others takes your ego from the driver's seat to the passenger seat and creates that space for you to be humble and not focus so much on yourself. Now, the E in awe is energy. And I think many people misinterpret this as, oh, wild, waving, crazy, over the top. I need to bowl people over with my energy. And for many of us who might be introverted, it's not our default temperature, so to speak. That, that seems like a, quite a challenge. So let's unpack energy uh, to make it more palatable for those of us who aren't just over the top. Sure. I, I'm really glad you said that because energy is very misunderstood. Energy to me is a dynamic that exists between people or among people, depending on how many you have. And no matter what, there is an energetic exchange between people and it can be either energizing or deflating, right? You just know those people, you want to have more of them in your life in those moments and other people, you just want to have less of them or none of them. And for some people, you can be, to your point, you can be very high energy and you can be deflating everybody around you because you're not giving anybody space to have their own energy. You're also um, not modulating it properly. And contrarily, you could be a low energy person, but I do think, again, energy works very much in concert with warmth. So if you are the type of person who might be a little bit lower energy, 
but you're very, very good at acknowledging other people. You're very attentive to others. You're a good listener. That high, high warmth not only creates a lot of warmth and connection and trust, but it also creates its own kind of energy that you want to be around that type of a person. And look, there's no one size fits all approach to this. You have to figure out what works well for you. But what I think you do have to do is figure out how are you kinetically connecting with other people in your energetic dynamic and what can you do about that? And that's where I think your focus should be. Yeah, I think a lot of us modulate our emotions to a degree where other people can't even perceive them anymore. And certainly in highly analytical jobs, which a lot of us tend to fall into our career, we start to view that emotional connection as weakness or something that's not as important. And to your point, that steals away from that energy and that ability for other people to feel connected to us. I, I agree with you. And it's funny the, the way you describe it. It's like, I don't know, part of me just feels like, look, who are we all faking? Who are we kidding? Like, I mean, we're all human beings. We're all like, we're all afraid of getting sick, our, 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 God forbid, our children dying, our parents dying. We want to have good health, happiness. We want to have friends. We all have the same insecurities. And it's, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm sorry, but I don't give a damn who you are. If you're Tony Robbins, you still have the same insecurities that I have. And so once you realize everybody's full of shit, excuse my language, and we all have the same insecurities, like I, th I find that liberating. It's liberating. And if we could all just be a little bit more, I'm not saying go walk around with your heart on your sleeve every second of the day. That's not what I'm suggesting. But if we could all walk around just a little bit more honest with ourselves and be a little bit more vulnerable, we'll connect so much more with people. And we, we don't have to hide as much. I think we got the title of your next book. Everyone's full of shit. My friends will all say, my friends will all say, it should have been your autobiography, you know, but. Well, I was just going to say one of the words that I, for energy or that encapsulates it, that you, one of them, enthusiasm. And if you could just show some general enthusiasm for where you are, what you're doing, who you're talking to, for yourself being alive in this moment. This is not a great stretch to do any of those things and it certainly goes a long way if i'm standing next to somebody who is excited to be next to me i'm going to be that much more excited to be hanging out with that person no matter where it might be you, you you're 100 right and i think you really hit on something that is a, i think a very important point for people to realize which is you talk about enthusiasm sometimes you're just not enthusiastic right i i get it but who cares Sometimes your job is to be enthusiastic, damn it. And you got to show up with some enthusiasm. You know, I, I hate to quote Woody Allen, but he did say, you know, 90% so of life is just showing up. And sometimes you got to show up with enthusiasm. You got to do things you don't want to do. And you do it for other people because they're going to do it for you. And that's the bottom line. Your job is to be there for your colleagues sometimes and to be enthusiastic with them. And I talk about this in the book is, Part of life is a performance. It is, I'm sorry, it's part of it's a performance. And sometimes when you just don't have that energy or enthusiasm for someone else, but you should know damn well that they need that, well, it's your job to do it. And maybe you guys are doing a podcast one day and maybe AJ needs you to pick him up and he's picked you up before. And you're just like, I don't want to do this, but you know what? You got to do it because that's what being a good teammate is. And that's what being a good colleague is. And I, I don't want to hear from people, well, I'm not enthusiastic. Well, just be it if it's important in that moment. It's certainly a, the lamest excuse of I'm just not that enthousi uh, enthusiastic. And for AJ and I working together for 15 years, there's, there's certainly times where we're showing up in different places, especially with all the uncertainty and craziness that has been going on. As of lately, AJ and I have both relied on, our, on each other to, to carry each other through this. Um, I also wanted to, to say to that aspect of, for myself, when the pandemic hit, one of the things that I wanted to do to make sure I've kept up my chops and to learn about something new is that I've been going live every weekday morning to our social media platforms. And of course, some days I have plenty to talk about and I'm really excited. But to do that every morning at 8.30, you can imagine that there's going to be times where I'm like, 
what the hell am I talking about today? And I can't believe I'm going to go in front of that camera. However, there is a, a few things that I'm going to do before that happens. I'm going to work out. I'm going to drink two cups of coffee. I'm going to have a big smile. And people always comment about the enthusiasm that I have for going on, but there, it is a performance. There are internal switches that are going to be turned off and on for myself to be able to do that and to do it at a level that I feel consistent and I'm happy with. Right, right. Well, I think you're, 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 you're pointing out to the fact that you're a professional. That's what you are. You're a professional and you're showing up. And it was, I think it was Derek Jeter who I think he was quoting Joe DiMaggio saying how he, every time he go to, he went out on the ball field, he tried his hardest because there might have been someone who was watching him for the first time or the last time. And that was his mindset. And, you know, it was funny. My mother once said to me when I was right out of law school and tried to get in the workforce, she said, you know, not everything is going to be fun every day. And she actually said, do you think Derek Jeter or whoever the shortstop was at the time, do you think he likes fielding ground balls for an hour every day? And he, it was fascinating to think about it. And not every part of your job, even the glamour jobs. I, I can't imagine Bruce Springsteen loves spring, singing Born in the USA for the five millionth time. But if you heard him in concert, you would think he was singing it for the very first time every time. Can we also state that he is going on for about three plus hours every night? <laughs> oh. oh, and as a performer and as somebody who's been on the road for our 40 minute sets, you could, that is a blink of an eye. It's incredible. To be up there for three and a half hours uh, every other night, if not every night at his age to that um, amount of catalog of of music it's incredible it's it's it's, un, it's incredible now there was some counterintuitive tips that i mentioned earlier one i wanted to unpack because I, I feel like this bit of advice is powerful but many many people are unfortunately doing the opposite and you advised practicing inconsistency with everyday replies what do you mean by this? And how is this so powerful? Because we've talked about it on the show and, and people kind of look at us funny and they don't realize the autopilot that they're in. Exactly. Um, you know, there, there's a guy that I know from my business who I, I think I referenced this in the book where you'll say to him, hey, I won't use his real name. Hey, Joe, how you doing? And he's like, oh, great. Never had a bad day in my life or never had a better day in my life. And, you know, it's, it's complete BS because, of course, like he's had bad days in his life. And there are people that answer the phone the exact same way, you know. And, and I just think it, you talk about authenticity. That's a lack of authenticity. Nobody is that consistent all the time. And it also lends itself to a lack of vulnerability. If you have this mask that you have to have on and you have to have this persona, this character that you're playing all the time, to me – you're not going to fool everybody. And it's really hard to play that role all the time. Just, you know, I, Oscar Wilde said it best, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. And I think if you can just master being yourself and the variability that creates, you'll connect way more with people. And I, I think in general, those soundbite answers to your point are so disingenuous that people just immediately are like, this person is not vulnerable. This person is not real. Oh, we're just doing this trite back and forth. And that's why so many people hate small talk. And, and you can stop people in their tracks with giving them an honest answer about how you're feeling and what's going on in the world around you instead of, oh, today's another great day. And when we encounter those autopilots in others, I also encourage you to break them and, and try to get them out of that loop because many of us are just walking around not even realizing it. And it's such a great power, not only yourself to not fall into that trap, but also pull other people out of that. And that's how you're going to stand out with that awe. I agree. And I have tried to do that with some of these people and it becomes a fun game that you can, that you can play with yourself. And look, I've also found that there's one guy that I know in my industry who is like, I used to say about him, this poor guy must be so tired at the end of the day. He was a, com a, a competitor agent. He must be so tired at the end of the day because he has to go home and take off his cape and take off his mask. And it must be exhausting for him. And you know, like, what one day I just decided, screw it. I'm going to try to break this guy down. And this is probably 10, 15 years ago. And now he's become a really close friend. We go for, he, he comes to New York. We go for cigars. He, he takes me to a club he belongs to. We drink. And he's behind that mask is a great guy. And I want to say to him, why don't you show this to everybody? You know, 
And, and, I, and I just think it's sad for him that he doesn't show it to enough people. Now, we love asking this question of our guests. We talk about the X factor being the right mindset and the right skills. And you've had an amazing career and now you're coaching and, and having all these breakthroughs for your clients. What has been your X factor? If you could pinpoint something that's made you unique. I do not care about rejection. I do not care about negativity. I don't really care about, you know, setbacks. They don't bother me. And like, for example, this book hasn't sold as well as I would have hoped it would done. I, if, if we weren't in the middle of pandemic, I would have done 15 in-person appearances and television appearances and everything got canceled. But you know what? I don't care. Within the limitations of my life right now, I'm going to go full speed ahead. And that's that. And that's just the way I've lived my entire life. And I think it goes back to being the, I have a younger sister, but being the third of three boys, being kind of the fat kid, getting made fun of, getting teased. And, you know, I don't know, just it created a level of resiliency in me that I, I personally think it's my greatest gift. And, and, and by the way, like halfway through writing this book, about a year and a half into it, we sent the manuscript to HarperCollins and they hated it. They literally hated it. And I was fairly certain that the, that the contract would be canceled and I have to give the money back. And my wife was like, who am I talking to? This isn't you. You're not going to quit. And I called up the editor and I had a meeting with her at Starbucks and I told her, I'm going to make this work. What do I have to do? And she said, go make it work. Rewrote the whole thing. And thank God they, they accepted it. But that's the mindset I think you have to have in life. And, and, and luckily, I always say, like, if you have the gift of being the fat kid uh, as a child and you can get made fun of and, and get teased and be that kid who everyone else makes fun of, but hopefully loves also, like John Candy and Stripes, that's the way you want to be raised. You don't want to be the kid that never gets made fun of. I, I would never want to redo my life as a popular kid. I love that advice. We love ending with a challenge for our listeners. As you picked up in our conversation, they're overachievers striving to break out of the norms, become extraordinary. If you could give them one challenge to end with, what would it be? Just figure out one thing that you don't know about yourself today that's holding you back in your life and make a vow to improve or eradicate that within 60 days. Excellent advice. All right. Well, we want to help you sell more books. Where can our audience find out more about uh, all of this amazing content and the book itself? One-stop shop. All you have to do is go to www.steven, S-T-E-V-E-N, hers, H-E-R-Z, www.stevenhers.com. You can follow me on all the social media platforms, read all the writings I've done and podcasts, and also uh, even download a free eight-page guide about the book. And hopefully and send you all that critical feedback. Exactly. And you can also buy the book right from the website or go to amazon.com. And I just want to thank you guys. You guys were great, really amazing conversation. Thanks for all the interest. Thank you for writing the book. It was fantastic and definitely a must read for our audience. Great. 